cloud. Okay, and we are good to go. Jeffrey, it's so good to see you from the other side of the continent. Uh, you've been away from Stanford for a while now, um, but you know, you and I have a long history where we, you know, began uh, the early parts of our careers here at Stanford. We've taught Dante together for freshmen for a number of years, and um, it's a real pleasure to be in this conversation with you uh, virtually for the Dante Society of America. I just saw the poster for the first time earlier today, and the title that was given to it is one that you chose. And I'm in intrigued about why, of all the verses, you know, in the Divine Comedy, you went with um, "Rivolti al monte o veragion ne fuga." Yeah, thanks for asking, Robert. And yeah, it's it's a pleasure to sort of pick up on a conversation that's been going on now for uh, several decades, uh, really. Um, and uh, um, I, I, I chose that line, um, not because it's a verse that particularly stands out, but uh, as most of you will recall, it's a verse that occurs right at the beginning of uh, Purgatory 3 in the wake of the Subitana Fuga that follows uh, Cato's rebuke at the end of Canto 2. And um, in teaching the poem, I've, I've come to like that verse for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, it has this word uh, that's really rich with uh, resonances, which is rivolti, with its echoes both of volto, face or gaze, and it even has features the root word for revolt, which is of course pertinent to the episode that's occurred in the prior canto, even if it's a kind of unwitting revolt. But I think it hints at the nonlinear, the kind of zigzagging ways in which we as humans pursue or attain insights under the kind of constant nagging, gnawing pressure, the frugare of reason, of ragion, which uh, we could here interpret as scholarly ambition or ethical ideals or justice as it's sometimes translated. Um, and so I guess that line came to mind because um, in both of our careers, we've moved, we've come from Dante studies at a kind of intensive phase of engagement with uh, Dante studies and with Dante's texts in particular, and then moved away and moved in different directions, often returning to the Dantean corpus, uh, which has had a nonetheless uh, shaping influence over our intellectual trajectories. And, you know, even if our course perhaps isn't quite as, um, quite, quite as rigorously structured as Dante's mountainscape might dictate, um, in that process of zigzagging back and forth between the world of Dantismo and other intellectual conversations and debates. Um, for me, at least, the moments that have been the most productive, the moments that um, have really shaped my thinking are really moments of, uh, of friction and uh, collision often between historical eras, between disciplines, between languages and cultures. That's for me where a lot of the most innovative and enlightening um, moments in my own intellectual um, uh, adventure have taken place. So I guess I was thinking in relation to our conversation about this question of going, turning away and turning back uh, and what does it produce? Um, and I'm curious to hear how you think about this in your own work where a Dantean thread is, is fairly evident at least at some level of each of the major books that you've written over the course of the last couple of decades. Yeah. Right. Well, in my case, before I, I speak autobiographically, one comment on Rajon and the castigation of Rajonai, uh, it somehow it reminded me of Inferno 27 when the devil comes to claim the soul of Guido da Montefeltro, and you have St. Francis there. And of course, the devil points out the logical contradiction in willing and repenting at the same time. And then tells, uh, so he wins that debate with Francis and, and he, he, he tells Guido, forse non pensavi che io fossi loico, that maybe I wasn't, a, didn't realize I was a, a logician. And it always struck me that as a comment on, there's also a demonic, say diabolical character about logic, which is a part of, good part of reason. And that um, I always thought of our colleagues in the analytic uh, philosophy uh, <laughs> uh, department here at Stanford as, as uh, being under the rubric of that devil. Anyway, yes, this revolge, you know, Purgatorio is, uh, for a long time uh, has been my favorite canticle. And I think it even begins with a, well, the whole canticle is in its some ways a, a looking back to the earth. It begins with all those body biographies of um, people buried and unburied and exhumed. So there's the, the characters themselves that we meet are looking back to their mortal remains. So and this uh, imagery of the, the sailors and, and home. There's nostalgia. It's a, there, there's a great deal of nostalgia in, in that. So I think that the line you know, that you chose is, is very um, you know, particular to the spirit and mood of Purgatorio. With regard to beginning as a Dante, uh, 
I don't want to. I don't want to call myself a dentist scholar. I've never considered myself a dentist scholar. I, I very deliberately chose to write my first book on the Vita Nova, my dissertation first book on the Vita Nova, not the Divine Comedy. I found that there was that you know the, the Divine Comedy was too too much of a battleground, uh, contested between you know well let's face it a lot of male rivalry. Uh, among the generations and a lot of edible issues between, uh, you know, students and, and teachers and, and, and there was kind of a hermeneutic contest about who owns, you know, who has the highest authority when it comes to uh, understanding the divine comedy. Nevertheless, you know, I was formed as a dentist scholar the way you were and it never, it never leaves you. Uh, and it was actually only later uh, when I, okay, so after writing The Body of Beatrice, I wrote a trilogy, what I consider a trilogy of books. One is Forest, The Shadow of Civilization, which is a, uh, a kind of selective history of forests in the Western imagination. Dante has his place in it, obviously. It's not a huge place, but he's in there. I went on to write a book called Dominion of the Dead, which is about the, world, the relations the living maintained with the dead in various secular domains. And then uh, I wrote a book on gardens, uh, an essay on the human condition. And it's only when I was finishing gardens that it struck me that I've been following a kind of Dantean percorso of, of being in the, in the Selva Oscura, in the Selva, let's say, then, uh, you know, descending into the underworld of the dead. And then there was, you know, the, the Giardini, the, you know, maybe Eden. Uh, so my next step will have to be something on paradise if I'm going to complete that trajectory. So it, it's really quite uncanny how um, how this thing unfolded without my intention. I I find that teaching the Divine Comedy that there's nothing more rewarding because of the fact that it's a, not only inexhaustible but every time I teach it and reread it, it's a different poem in many ways. Uh, I still cannot um, consider myself a Dante scholar because I have not. Uh, pursued a career as a, as a Dante specialist. I published a bunch of stuff on Dante. I have about five articles in the New York Review of Books on him, and I keep um, getting invited to speak about him and do this conversation. It's just one, one example. And, uh, you know, frankly, I think that my relationship to Dante is one that where I need to maintain a certain distance from him so that I don't start um, becoming antagonistic and hostile towards him. Because I think that if I were a full fledged Dante scholar that, uh, you know, this author would really start annoying me and angering me in, in many ways, because he is so tyrannical when it comes to how he wants you to read him. And it's a really monumental struggle to um, free his poem from his own authorial self-editorializing gestures all the time. And I don't know how, you know, full-fledged Dante scholars do it without getting exasperated, but you know, they do, and I, I just can't do it. You know, it's really interesting to hear you speak in those terms, because I, I probably wouldn't use those terms, but in my own oscillations of uh, turning away and turning towards the poem, um, uh, there's no question that I always come back to a different poem, and it's that those differences that for me are generative, um, and um, in a sense, it's never been for me like for you, I think, a question of either or, of choosing one side, uh, dedicating oneself to one as if it were in rivalry with the other. It, I always had a broader set of intellectual passions that really flanked my discovery, actually preceded my discovery of Dante in the Middle Ages, which was largely, largely conditioned by teachers, John Fichero in the first instance, um, but more broadly the tradition of the kind of philological but history of ideas tradition that, that I think John's John brilliantly synthesized and embodied and, and, and updated and you know, brought into the moment, into the present moment, that for me was so powerful. And it brought this kind of anchorage point, but it was always a, a one node within a larger set of passions of, uh, you know, sense of deep engagement with the laboratory of the avant-garde, a practical and theoretical interest in design and architecture, an interest in computation and machines and engineering. Um, and I just, maybe I never grew up, but I never felt like I had to choose. I always felt that the one, that moving back and forth, shuttling back and forth between those domains, the one fed the other. And uh, that uh, I actually liked the kind of sense of, not disciplinary homelessness, but of uh, a kind of, movement between domains of specialization. Um, and, and that's where that's left me today is being really interested mostly in forms of engagement with Dante, Dante's corpus that 
somehow apply pressure from the outside, you know? Um, so even if I wouldn't quite use the language that you used, um, which, which I fully I, resonates for me and I understand what get really uh, grabs my, my attention, sort of captures my imagination right now are readings of the corpus that come from other positions, disciplinary positions. Can you and, give some examples, Jeff? Yeah, sure. Well, I just had, uh, I taught a, a, a class as part of my Dante and Material Culture course, which is sort of part of my, at least my little contribution to the, the 700 year anniversary of Dante's death celebrations uh, uh, on um, a, a class on um, um, the, uh, uh, that was dedicated to one of a sequence of themes. This is the, the 10th of, I believe the 10th, maybe the 11th uh, theme. You participated in an earlier one on forests, on, on the woods. Um, it was a, um, a class on the mirror, on the mirror as an object, but of course the mirror is an object that anchors a whole set of philosophical theoretical r ruminations that range from theology to optics, from, in other words, from metaphysics to the natural sciences. And the guest was the Italian, Franco-Italian philosopher, Emanuele Coccia, whose book, The Sensible Life, A Microontology of the Image, really brilliantly brings alive one of the central philosophical threads of Dante's time, which is that reflection on Aristotle's ideas about perception and the nature of images, uh, the imago, uh, um, and particularly picks up on the way Averroes in his commentaries on the De Anima essentially founds media theory. I mean, that's a, a kind of cartoonish way of describing the argument of the book. But for me, that's just, uh, I found reading and, and hearing Emanuele talk about this really exciting because whereas a lot of attempts to update or somehow bring alive in the present um, pieces from the Roma past feel rather forced or rather loosely coupled, if you like, in this case, we're talking about an argument that's a very strong argument because of course, modern media theory was, uh, was in a sense given birth to through the career of a Thomist, uh, Marshall McLuhan, <laughs> somebody who knew quite a bit about Aristotle's theory of perception and images and the medial nature of how they are transmitted between objects and subjects. So um, it's those lateral entry points, whether it's from anthropology, the study of material culture, um, other, frameworks, maybe philosophical ones that match my own intellectual appetites today and that prompt what seemed to me to be the, the insights that um, take us forward rather than moving us into this very centripetal model of you know, interpretive inquiry. Well, you know, that's interesting if you think of, especially Guido Cavalcanti, who even more than Dante in this early part of his career, he was the one who was a steeped in Averroes, and he had a theory of the image that he developed in the phantasm, uh, as, as he put it. And I've always maintained, or at least one of the arguments from Dante Beatrice maintained that one of, the, um, one of the fault lines that divide Guido from Dante and part of the misunderstanding in that relationship is it revolves around this question of the image. Because using an Averroistic Aristotelian, radical Aristotelian psychology, uh, at least Dona Mi Prega has been read by certain commentators, uh, Maria Corti among others, as being, um, as presenting a theory of, of the image that comes through the abstractive operation of the intellect on the sensible body, namely the external woman, for example, and, uh, you know, entering into the, into the mind as a sheer, um, sheer image, a disembodied image, and that the love passion is fixated upon the phantasm and not on the person. Mm -hmm. And that is very much in line with what you were describing with the, you know, the, the media theory. I, on the other hand, I think Dante could never have become the poet of the Divine Comedy if he um, subscribed entirely only to a phantasmatic understanding of love and of personhood. And therefore, I, that's why I argue that the, the um, there's a kind of otherness and opacity and density, kind of incarnational density to Beatrice where she just simply cannot be reduced to um, an image, but it's her embodied personhood that's out there in the public world for all to see that um, is a, a sign of her, uh, well, her passage mm -hmm. through Florence, her passage through life. And uh, in that sense, that's where I would see the Christological you know, aspect of, of, her, of her figure anyway. So that's interesting. And also what you were, to go back to something you mentioned about, you know, studying with John, 
Frichero, who uh, the first course I ever took as a graduate student at Cornell was one with John Frichero, who came and taught a, a mini seminar. He taught the whole poem in you know ten sessions, compressed in two weeks. But nevertheless, um, you know, John made the great decade for American Dantismo in the recent times is I think in the seventies when Frichero was at Yale. And he was, um, and this was also the time when deconstruction was becoming, you know, the big rage. Yeah. And there was something about um, John was able to import into his reading of the Divine Comedy all this new, exciting stuff that was taking pl place in French theory, in a way that drew all these students to his courses who had no interest either in the Middle Ages or in Dante in particular, because he was able to show that this poem had an uncanny uh, openness to the, these kind of um, perspectives. And I think what you're describing in terms of the mirror is uh, one instance of where it, yeah, I think there's a great deal of, of hermeneutic potential in the divine comedy, which remains completely unexploited to this day. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I feel that very much. And um, I think that, you know, often um, I'm misread as a sort of opponent of philology. Um, but I, I'm really not. I was trained in a romance philology sort of setting, um, both in Europe and the United States. Um, and the kind of models of philology that really excited my imagination are ones where there's a very strong component of adventure. I mean, they fly high, they look outward, they stretch often back to the roots, the early approaches, attempts to create a kind of science of literature of some kind. I mean, if you think all the way back to Wolf's, you know, prolegomena and uh, Homer, um, and or forward to the generation of um, some of John Frigero's teachers, you know, Leo Spitzer was among them, you know, Spitzer's classical and Christian ideas of world harmony. That's a mad book. You know, it's a book that flies, you know, that performs an overflight of 10 centuries of cultural history easily, maybe more. I'm probably, probably underestimating. Um, it's completely, you know, the footnotes are pulled out of the thin air, <laughs> um, but it's a spectacular performance. Uh, not just a very addition, but it's a work of intellectual history, if you like, that has a kind of excitement to it that um, I feel that uh, the sort of derivative, you know, the last few decades of rigorous work in that kind of philological vein have turned inward. You know, they, they just, they don't fly high. They look inward, they're centripetal, as I said, um, and they connect less emphatically with the passions of our moment, not to mention these panoramic horizons, which really, you know, create a connective tissue between a text which very much belongs to its time, which is Dante's poem and his whole corpus of writings, um, but that still gives so much to the present when it's approached in a way that can, in a sense, free those nuggets of interest that potentially yield new meanings, especially from the the way that they're so deeply entangled, particularly in the commentary tradition, but in other traditions that are very textualist in their biases, you know. Yeah, you know, I don't, I, textualist, textualism is, is fine. <clears throat> I think one always has to read Dante very carefully, uh, close reading, so textual in that sense. But I agree with you that the um, redimensioning of, 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 of philology in the diminishment of the parameters of what is understood as philology is it's, it's rather depressing because it um, rather than being expansive as you were describing from the earlier generation you know, it, it's 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 about minutia you know? mm -hmm. and if we're going to you know nitpick about the minutia of the poem then it's important i mean i i'm always interested in you know the small details but i agree that if you cannot somehow animate the passions then, then it's um, then what makes the Dante so unique is being discarded, which is his singular capacity to um, get people to fall in love with the poem. Not only fall in love with the poem. I mean, those uh, when I was a graduate student, you know, doing Dante was first thing. The, the poem is all about amor. Amor is the very principle of of movement of the whole cosmos. But it was also you, you, people. Um, there was a kind of erotics in the Dante Dantismo in America, where everything was was uh, kind of stimulating and exciting, and students would fall in love with their teachers and saying that 
moment they would fall in love with the poem and then they would fall in, end with each other and so forth. And I think that the kind of philology you're, you're describing has taken all the eros out of mm -hmm. uh, Dante, you know, Dante studies. And, and that's a, a shame because uh, we know that um, it really should be the other way around. I mean, I, I think I, I think that the um, uh, there's been some wonderful writing and and wonderful teaching. I think, um, particularly coming from poets um, who continue to engage and mine Dante's text and his precedent in in some rich ways, that maybe are another sort of parallel track for how Dante stays alive and endures, in a sense, in the in the present cultural moment, however however remote it may seem. I mean, and this is me speaking perhaps as a historian of the avant-garde, but I continue to, 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 to think in terms of Dante and to go back to the poem thinking about this question of the, of the making of worlds through words, like world making as word making and word making as world making, which I think is one of the aspects of Dante's uh, career that captured, certainly captured the Anglo-American modernists um, the, uh, and certainly much of the, the tradition of experimental poetry in the 20th century. And, um, and in a sense, it took that many centuries between the late you know, 13th and early 14th centuries and the turn of the 20th century for uh, that same sense of freedom that Dante had with respect to his approach to tradition, his, re, his appropriation and reworking of classical tradition, but also even contemporary, his engagement with contemporary um, interlocutors uh, for poets to feel that same sense of power, authority, maybe excessive authority, maybe arrogance in some way. Right. Although I would say, Jeff, that I would take it back to the Romantics. I just taught a, finished teaching a course with a colleague of mine, Denise Gigante, in the English department on Dante and the Romantics. And you know, those, those Romantics were pretty radical. And they were, they had a, uh, you can read Shelley in the Defense of Poetry, talk about how you know, Dante's poem is kind of smoldering, and, and, and all it needs is a few sparks to come alive again. No, and and and, and he understood that, you know, his romantic vocation is as doing that in some ways. Blake's illustrations of Dante and so forth. So, I would I would say that it's true that the, the romantics plus the what's taking place in the 20th century, yeah, that they're, they're dealing with a different Dante there altogether. Um, and I, I don't want to be misunderstood when I when I read articles in the Dante. Yeah, uh, Dante studies, and and uh, I'm a big fan of all the hard work that goes into getting the poem right, as it were. But there's still that question of how do you uh, do what Shelley said that we have to do, which is to um, find the spark that will light it up again. Uh, you know, and to tell you the truth, I think the inferno for me is still the the way in which I can best get a grasp on our contemporary social and political realities. I mean. When I, when I, uh, when, when I think of, you know, the capitalist economy, I really have to think of Inferno Six and gluttony. I don't know too many gluttons. I, in the in the clinical sense that Chaco was perhaps, but uh, what I do know is that we, you know, we have an economy which is predicated on overconsumption. Too much is just enough in America, uh, in, the, in the economy, and the whole ecological uh, dilemma that we face today is uh, you, you would say, well, where would where would that part of our society belong in Dante's Inferno? Well, we know that it would belong in the third circle there if you wanted to take gluttony as, you know, the the, the primary vice of a certain kind of uh, economy of, of overconsumption. And from there on, you can go to, you know, various other circles and you can find that, uh, you know, anger, have you, anyone turned on the radio, anyone look at, at the at evening news and, and uh, Blogs. I mean, uh, and and the way you can, for example, go into the into the anger and see the connection between sullenness, wrath, and um, you know a certain kind of sloth. These are separate aspects of um, of things that that lead to um, you know that steamy miasma of, of you know that that river. Uh, you know, for me, it's it, it reveals something essential about the kind of uh, anger that dominates political discourse and partisan warfare in our own, you know, American Republic, for example, and I can go on and on, I can, uh, you know, yeah. uh, but, but I, but, you know, this is Dante who's teaching me how to think about certain things like that. 
Yeah, I, I, I don't think, I mean, some might feel that there's a, a, there's a big stretch there, but, you know, the reality is that the, the very modernity of the period that Dante belongs to, um, it's a modernity that he's one of the harshest critics of, uh, is the, the modernity that invented the credit economy, in a sense, right. banking, money lending, the internet, the, glo uh, the beginnings of a kind of globalization through certain industries in particular that the Florentines and certainly Central and Northern Italy excelled in. Uh, took took hold and began to transform the cultural landscape, not to mention the moral landscape of society. So, absolutely, and it, and for him, it all goes back to the you know the avarice, mm -hmm. which is you know and cupidity as the radix malorum. It's the mm -hmm. root of all of all uh, all evil in that sense. Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to the point you made with regard to Shelley a little bit earlier. Um, before we skip over um, to to other topics, um, and. And I guess just ask you in a more pointed way where you see those sparks coming from. I sort of began to, get, to provide my own answer, which were some of these more lateral approaches that, that maybe apply pressure to the poem in some new ways, some unfamiliar ways, or um, um, open up estranging perspectives, if you'd like. Um, uh, where, do you, where do you see that spark as coming from? Um, well, I think there's more than one. There, there, there's any number of sparks, and I, and I can't speak prescriptively because I, the kind of sparks that I can, uh, I can ignite the poem with are, are, you know, perhaps pertain to my own particular set of intellectual concerns. Uh, but as you know, you know, the forest was a, and we talked about that in your seminar when I when you invited me to speak to your students about the way that uh, there's a whole issue there, which uh, I didn't I didn't actually do justice in any way in my treatment of Dante and the, the forest thing, because I subsequently went on to, to read an, um, the poem more carefully. And it struck me that, you know, the forest there in Purgatorio is, uh, it's not a garden. E Eden is not a garden. It's a very thick, dense forest where he says neither moonshine nor sunshine can actually penetrate the leaves. So we're back in a very dark place. Mm -hmm. And the question is, you know, so you can, I'm very sympathetic to your thing about material culture. I, you know, I, I'm particularly, um, I think there's a lot that one can do in order to bring out this very ambivalent, this ambivalence that you pointed to about Dante's relationship to the, um, the modern age. Because on the one hand, he pre-dams it for its overreaching, for its cupidity. Ulysses, I think, is a figure for something that will stand for the age of exploration, the, um, the pursuit of knowledge, the scientific revolutions, and this, uh, and all the way up to Star Trek, to boldly go where no one has gone before. Well, who is that except Ulysses, no? And what science is still driven by this Ulyssian, Dantesque loop, Ulyssian uh, imperative. And um, so that stands condemned proleptically in the poem, but at the same time, who can deny that some of the most powerful figures in hell are uh, figures of human modern autonomy, the autonomy of self. Francesca, I, for, for a long time, I, I just wanted to, um, you know, uh, ignore Francesca's fascination and seduction because I was brought up in the, you know, the American hermeneutics of suspicion about anything that a sinner in, set in hell says, no, you have to re -damn them by understanding why they're damned. And so I thought that Francesca was a, a seductress that was, um, and, and that the students who would fall in love with her, as they always do when they've done it for the first time, were, were just not getting it. But then you think about it and you, and you find that here's a character here's, who has very clearly made a, an existential choice in the most good faith Sartrean manner possible. She wants to be a great literary heroine and she wants to muscle her way into the divine comedy. And when Dante, when she sees Dante there in her circle that she knows that this is her one chance to make it in, into the annals of, of literary history and become the equal of Helen of Dido and the others. And she nails that addition, you know, flawlessly with the most spectacular performance I mean, and, and the most condensed modern uh, kind of poetics that makes Dido's torrents of woes and all those long kind of soliloquies that you get just seem very obsolete. And so, and, and she is completely existentially committed to who she wants to be. So she ends up finally as 
uh, against Dante's own intentions as, as a figure of, of pure self-determination. She has chosen herself. She's paying the price, whatever that price is, but she is um, a champion of autonomy, female autonomy above all. So yes, th there are other characters, uh, Ulysses, one of them, and, and, and others who, who um, they, they don't fit very comfortably within Dante's theology, but they do speak across the divide to our modernity in a way that um, we, uh, we have to recognize some of our modern values being embodied in them. I think one of the interesting things in the um, sort of staging of Francesca that you just put forward is the emphasis on a kind of performative reading. Performative understood in a number of different ways. But, right. um, and certainly one of the ways that Dante's poem has been kept alive and updated and constantly refreshed in a sense in the Italian tradition has been through its restagings of it, re-performance re of it, translations of it across media, so to speak. Um, operatic ones, but, but theatrical and other ones, um, even cinematographic ones as well. And certainly that's a viable tradition of interpretation understood in the broad, almost the musical or theatrical sense of interpretation that I think represents maybe one interesting answer to the question of how you keep a text that belongs to the remote past alive in the present. I guess the, the question I was gonna ask that maybe is a little bit of a non sequitur, but um, interests me, it, along that, that axis of performativity is um, one thing about performative works is that they tend to travel across cultures and be interpreted or reinterpreted in different cultural settings, often in a very different key than uh, was the key of at least that they themselves dictate or propose. And Dante's text is, as you alluded to earlier in the conversation, one that sets out to, to very much control um, the readerly experience and uh, the, the process of interpretation. But, you know, whereas in Shakespeare studies, for example, there's been this turn towards global Shakespeare, uh, a, a, a whole cottage industry, if you like, of work on extra European modes of appropriation, restaging, reuse, reinterpretation. Um, Dante studies remains, and Dante himself perhaps, despite the, the romance between Anglo-American culture and um, the high middle ages in um, central and Northern Italy, Dante, Dante remains more an Italian figure than a global figure, I would say. And I, I guess I'm, I'm just curious, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe there are, there is another history, another lineage uh, that would stretch out in a global direction, but um, it's not one that I've really seen explored in the broader conversation. I'm, I'm curious what you, if you have any thoughts about that. Well, I, yeah, I do have a few thoughts, you know, I, because um, on the one hand, this, uh, the Dante Society is, is, has this whole conference, part of it is devoted to, you know, Dante in the Americas. So I think that's very promising that we're getting, you know, uh, expanding beyond the Anglo-European. And it's going to be very interesting to see what comes out of that. Uh, but I, I, unfortunately, I just don't know enough about what that's going to yield for me, you know, make any comment on it. What I would say about Dante's uh, being still identified, well, two things. One is that Dante's stock is very high. I mean, just it's at a historic high for some reason, at least in, in the European, and I think Western European and Anglo-American worlds, his stock is very high. For, there's something about that poem which is still intrigues a lot. You still get a lot of students taking it and he's the one dead white male who seems to, to uh, escape you know, the, uh, the general skepticism about the value of that tradition. And the other thing, the difference between Dante and Shakespeare, why it's so much easier to have a global Shakespeare than a global Dante, in my view, is because Shakespeare did not have a, you know, a self that was so well defined as a historical and uh, belonging to one particular city with one life story and where that self is being staged so um, in so many different ways in the Divine Comedy. And so Dante remains a Florentine, and there's something very provincial about the first person singular of the Divine Comedy. It's a universal everyman in, in many ways, but it's also the, the, the root of it is the Florentine uh, first person singular. You don't have that in Shakespeare at all. So therefore maybe Shakespeare travels, you know, much more easily. He, uh, he's more like, uh, you know, he, he's more belongs to the air than to the earth. Uh, so. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice way to, to put it. And, and, you know, it could be, it could be that, you know, theatrical works by their very nature have a kind of porosity that uh, a tightly wound poetic work like the comedy doesn't. Um, 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 but um, I guess I'm curious also with respect to traditions, exegetical traditions, 
and, and that, there's a difference there, certainly. You know, the Lectura Dantis, for example, as a model of, you know, of engagement with a poem, um, uh, there, I don't think there's an equivalent in a, a domain like Shakespeare studies, you know, where you would treat a unit like act by act readings of, you know, Othello, <laughs> for example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. I, I'm person. My personal view is that, you know, no matter how venerable they might be, formats and genres can exhaust themselves. And I, I will probably celebrate the day when the last Lectura Dantis is, is completed. Um, and I would probably welcome the invention of new modes of animating and engaging with Dante's text than canto by canto readings. But I don't, I don't know what you think about that, that issue. Uh, you know, much as I understand the civic meaning sometimes or the symbolic meaning, if you like, of the staging of those kinds of performances yeah. of the poem, um, I wonder if they aren't part of a problem when it comes to, um, to enlivening the poem. Yeah, you know, I, I'm I'm a bit more neutral on that than you are, Jeff. I think because, um, well, you know, I think uh, Teodolinda Barolini's commento Baroliniano, the online thing, is it's it's magnificent. I mean, it's fantastic. If you're, you know, you can go consult it. I always can consult in particular cantos that uh, I might be dealing with for one reason or another, always profitably. So I think. Um, I think that it has a role, the lectura dantis has a role to play. I also believe that the genre of the lectura dantis is, is due to the poem itself, which is not like a Shakespeare play. I mean, it does tell a larger story, but it is itself broken up into these segments and episodes that are you know, semi-autonomous one from the other. And that um, you know, require that you start anew every time you meet a new character, you have an, a new speech or um, you're on a, a different terrace uh, and, the, the dynamics are always so local and, and specific to where you are in the poem that it's, uh, I don't think it's by chance that that tradition of the canto by canto is, has arisen. At the same time, as we know, the American uh, paradigm of Dante commentary uh, arose largely in reaction against the lectura dantis, which has Crocian, Benedetto Crocian roots in Italy, where Croce thought that the overarching structure of the poem uh, was part of the obsolete medieval machine, allegorical machine of it, and that the real value was in these individual moments of, of sheer poetic in, in, intuition and so forth. Whereas Singleton and John following in that Singletonian tradition insisted in, about going back to see, you know, what the, what the larger uh, whole story of, of the Commedia is. That, um, that paradigm, in my view, has its own problems. And it, and the problem is that it, its insistence on coherence and totality and harmony are belied by a close reading, textual reading of the poem. And in so many moments, it shows that it doesn't conform very uh, neatly at all to these uh, overarching structures that have been posited by the Singletonians. So uh, I guess I, I think that if the lectura dantis genre is, is if it's going to lose its steam, it will lose its steam, and it will um, probably go into remission for a, you know a, a few decades or something. And then who knows? I mean, I, I don't feel like I I don't have anything to to prescribe or or to you know not prescribe to the uh, Dante scholars because I feel like I haven't kind of earned the, the credentials. That, that yeah, I'm not sure if I if I have either. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> again, I, I I do think though that frameworks matter. And when you, when you accept the frameworks that uh, that a work, even a brilliant work of the imagination like the Commedia, um, imposes upon you, you're stepping inside that structure. You're not creating a series of outside structures that allow you to see into it. Um, so uh, that's the, one of the reasons why methodologies that uh, apply some you know kind of lateral pressure or offer lateral points of entry strike me as particularly interesting. Um, and you know even though. I haven't been publishing much for the last 15 years in the field of Dante studies. The, the projects that are, that are basically sitting in a drawer somewhere in some state of development, like a, a talk that I gave at the Dante Society of America about a decade ago, um, entitled Dante and the Pace of Epic. Right, can you say about, something about that? Yeah, well, it's, I'll say a few things about it. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's really looking at the poem in a way that the poem doesn't essentially give away, but that makes sense within ter in terms of the larger genealogical structures that the poem is built around. What it does is it, it starts with 
the 19th century obsession with um, proving the scientific accuracy or finding a correct scientific understanding, a rigorous standardized understanding of all of the measurements and all of the movements in the poem, basically, to take the aspect of mapping that's so central to Dante's way of positing the three realms of the afterlife, um, to take those literally and to, to diagram them, describe them and measure them. And on the basis of that work, it then goes back and applies that same filter to predecessor epics and subsequent epics and tries to show that within the epic tradition, there was this awareness of competition, rivalry and imitation that includes a kind of outdoing topos in terms of the distance that's traveled. You mentioned the opening of Star Wars, <laughs> which would Star be- Trek. Star, oh, Trek, sorry, yeah. Star Trek, uh, Star Trek, uh, not Star Wars, which represents an extreme um, continuation of that very narrative, which is you always have to go to explore worlds that are further, at, you know, beyond, more remote, more distant, more difficult to uh, to gain access to. And therefore the nature of the journey is constantly accelerating. In other words, there's a rhetoric of acceleration that is part of that logic of imitation and and, and outdoing. Um, so that's just one example, but- You're absolutely right, by the way, just, yeah. you know, when, you, when you're when you talking about the acceleration, when you get to Paradiso, you have, it's like it's like the starship going into warp drive and you know, exactly. when you just see the thing and it's just gone, you know? Exactly, exactly. And then once you start looking at so many, I mean, not only the abundance of references to velocity, but to the spinning things, the moving things, the sort of psychedelia, if you like, of the final canticle, you start to see how accelerated motion is such a central thematic in, in the entire medieval imagination with regard to the supernatural, you know? Um, and it's easy enough to demonstrate how the theology of angels, how so, so many aspects of the belief system were anchored in these ideas about, about rapid motion, not instantaneous motion, but rapid motion. Um, the reason I mentioned that is just, that's a lateral perspective. Like that's not a perspective that comes from necessarily inside a, a particular, it uses some aspects of the, of the uh, critical tradition, but it uses them almost against their own purpose to show that there's something else going on. Um, and uh, for me, at least, those have tended to be the topics that continue to engage my attention. And I, I worry that these, that the framework issue is, a, is an issue that limits sometimes the, right. the, the mode of engagement or the mode of, in, of interpretation. Um, um, yeah, so um, so anyhow, I guess yeah, I, I think I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And this idea of motion and acceleration and speed, and, and you have there at the end where, where the outermost sphere is a fastest, and then it's the inner the one closest at going the fastest, and it's mind blowing stuff. And it's all integrated with the larger dynamic of what you know. The poem. Be, let's not forget that the poem begins in a condition of paralysis exactly. and immobilization. And wherever things are are static and not moving, that's very bad. It's usually, you know, it means perdition. It's the Medusa, it's the threat of petrification exactly. that the Medusa represents. Yeah. And the poem is has to be in constant motion. And even the rhyme scheme, the Terza Rima, is, is something that keeps it propelled always forward. Now, the, the risk you would think that Dante engaged in, but, but did not pay a price for, is that when, when things can, can spin out of control, uh, you know, like the 60s did with the psychedelia and you, things get more and more fast and things and all of a sudden you crash and burn. Paradiso keeps upping the ante, mm -hmm. you know, almost canto by canto and certainly sphere by sphere. And, and you, he's being blasted, you know, with ever greater over sen sensorial overload. Uh, but, you know, fortunately he makes it to the very end in this state of hyper excitation. It's, it's a constant rapture that is intensifying and accelerating all the time. And, you know, the, the risk is that you can, you know, that's what, that's why my favorite line goes back to, you know, your, your uh, Purgatorio 3 at the very, in, in Purgatorio 2, when Dante is so over ego, eager to embrace a fellow shade, he doesn't even recognize Cazella, mm -hmm. and he just, he, he's so desperate for human contact and affection, maybe like he had been in COVID for a whole year. <laughs> and my favorite verse of the entire Commedia is when um, Cazella tells him, but suavamente mi disse che io posasse. Mm -hmm. And that verse, suavamente mi disse che io posasse, is so reposeful. And it's like this moment of uh, kind of serenity. And we know that that becomes the prelude of a kind of song where you have this kind of aesthetic stasis. And as you were saying, the, the figure of reason, Cato, comes to chastise everyone for indulging in a moment of relaxation. But um, 
And so from there on, everything gets you know more and more forward and faster and faster. But yeah. I like that. Every every time you look away, you have to look back and off they go again. You know, right. and, and I mean, I think to your point, you know, movement is you know movement is life, and stasis is death in in this ontology. Um, so uh, except for it, God, God is still right, right. But but that's the transcend point of transcendence. That's yeah. the the you know the the underpinning of the system that makes this system that's a dynamic system um, come to life and bear meaning, right, and bear fruit. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so in, in wrapping up this conversation, I'm, I'm curious, um, you touched upon the theme of the overall celebration that the Dante Society is holding. Um, and um, I guess I'm curious to hear you say a few more words about what Dante coming to America circa you know, 2021, <laughs> what kind of freight or baggage um, that tr act of translation bears and, uh, and where, it, where it carries us. Well, you know, I hear, I, I'm, I, I, I'm going to hope that our, our um, other American, Latin American colleagues can, can uh, continue the story because really we're, this is a Ulyssian um, voyage of crossing into the, you know, the other hemisphere like the Terra Nova. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't end well for Ulysses, but we know it ends well for Dante who kind of goes in the, on a similar journey. And I think that it's not until you, you are in this horizon, this new horizon that pockets of, um, of the unspoken and the unrealized potential of, of the poem will, will be, will be um, lit up the way Shelley was, was um, uh, recommending that, that uh, the poets do. And I, and I couldn't agree with you more that it's most likely the poets who are going to lead the way in terms of um, finding those pockets of, of, um, uh, of the unfinished story of the Commedia mm -hmm. and uh, you know, doing the work of, of um, you know, moving it still forward. Yeah, I think that- I mean, What about you? What, what, what do you expect from this? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, like, I like that idea. And, um, and I've certainly in the course of my uh, peregrinations on the American continent, both through works of literature and uh, literal travels, uh, um, found at least crumbs, breadcrumbs, little pieces of a larger story, which um, I, I certainly have never seen fully reconstructed of the way, some of the ways in which this moment of you know, mature late medieval culture resonates for people a continent away and, and really many, many centuries away. Um, um, and I think that would be a fascinating coda to this story, which at least on this occasion, this 700th anniversary occasion, where is bringing us virtually, at least in my case, literally, despite the fact I'm in a Wunderkammer uh, from a few centuries ago, I'm actually in Cambridge, at, you know, the, in the home of where the Dante Society was founded in the 19th century, founded really by generalists, by you know, not by Dantisti so much as by the first generation of um, sort of 19th century Americans who fell in love with it. Uh, with Dante and Dante's poem and Dante's world, for that matter, um, but but I do think that there is a continental dimension that um, could be an exciting dimension to look forward to. Um, anyhow, it's been it's been great to have this conversation with you, and uh, um, um, it's not quite a happy birthday, you know. Um, it's it's a happy um, sort of commemorative moment rather than a, a, a birth moment, right? But very much so, yeah. And there's going to be several others to follow, I'm sure. So. Yeah. It's that's great, Jeff. Thanks a lot. And uh, thanks to the Dantha Society for uh, encouraging this conversation. I hope yes. I'm looking forward to what, what goes on. Yeah. Take care. <laughs>